Hello and welcome to this webinar titled Integrity Assurance for Single Use Systems End User Perspective, hosted by Biopharma Asia Magazine and presented by Charlotte Maisy, Product Manager in Global Support GSK Vaccines, and Donald Young Sr., Product Manager at Thermo Fisher Scientific. My name is Stephen Edwards and I'll be your moderator. Now, please allow me to introduce our first presenter. Charlotte Maisie is bioengineer with a PhD in material science in surface chemistry. She has done her career in material science, spending 20 years working on the investigation, research, and services for all sectors, but mainly for pharmaceutical products at Solvay, Ajinomoto, PAL, and GSK vaccines. She has 15 years of experience in CGMP in various positions, including QC, QA, and engineering. She is an expert in single use at GSK Vaccines since 2010 and working on integrity tests for five years. I will now be handing over to our first presenter. Welcome, Dr. Maisie. Hello, everybody. So I'm going to give you um, a presentation on uh, integrity as a point of view of the end user. Maybe uh, just to give you um, a very brief idea on uh, what GSK, what is the experience and, and the coverage we have as GSK. Uh, GSK is working on pharmaceutical, on vaccine and consumer healthcare with quite a large uh, number of vaccine dose and uh, medicine pack. Uh, so we, ha we have uh, several um, sites. We have 15 sites and in this 15 sites I would say that single use is used in 11 sites on a regular basis. So um, with this, I wanted to tell you also that indeed, um, as um, a manufacturer of uh, a sterile product and vaccine, um, we, want of, we have been working and using single use to improve our process. If we look at uh, the change through history um, from what we were doing in the 15 and uh, uh, what we do now, um, I think we have been using a single use to try to close uh, the process as much as possible, avoiding any uh, contamination. Uh, so why I think it's interesting to also that I can give you my point as an end user, because working um, in a vaccine, um, one of the critical things is that we have no thermal sterilization in our uh, on our product. Uh, on most of our products, there is no filtration after addition of the adjuvant, and so we cannot rely on sterile filtration. Um, so the last sterilization step is quite early uh, in the process. It's quite critical so to maintain the system closed. Uh, also, we GSK uh, has been uh, using uh, as globally and uh, not only also vaccine. If we look at all the MPUs, the business units uh, working uh, manufacturing uh, vaccine, um, we have quite, like I said, um, uh, 11 sites, 32 uh, MPUs, which give us quite a various uh, application. And so um, in this GMP environment, um, uh, we have, of course, uh, with one process, uh, we have to look at multiple solutions and we have to, to see if they, are, uh, they can be used in our process. So with this in mind, I, I'm going to give you um, what we um, want uh, and as an end user uh, uh, when we use single use. We, of course, uh, find that it's very easy to use single use as ready to use solution. We can work with such uh, um, a system to avoid cross contamination, operation in great CD, a high flexibility. Uh, we can reduce cleaning when we use single use. We can also re reduce the plant's footprint reduce the cost, um, uh, the capex cost, and so um, um, it's important to, um, to, to, to it, it is very important all this action and specifically operating in uh, room uh, CD, help also uh, having people working in appropriate environment and uh, uh, having um, uh, um, some ergonomy to work uh, and helping having avoiding any uh, issue. Um, the flexibility and the reduce of cleaning, all of this is, of course, of high importance for us, but what is sure is that we cannot 
um, uh, introduce single use if you don't we don't have this insurance regarding single use integrity it's critical in this context and so um, we in the qualification approach regarding the insurance of integrity we have been following and I give you at the table here and if you want more um, uh, information we have been working really following a BPSA white paper um, so all along um, our uh, end user evaluation implementation uh, impl transportation pre-use and post-use uh, we are uh, following the concept behind about uh, because we think that the integrity is not only after you implement it's from the start from the design from the development you have to look if you are in the design space to re or review uh, what you have as, as uh, uh, validation um, information and gap and it is really critical uh, to start from the start this evaluation in order to be sure that at the end you only remain with a few risks um, and you tackle those risks um, and really invite you if you want to go deeper uh, in the subject of integrity to look at uh, uh, this white paper. Um, w if we analyze as GSK failure uh, that we have in leak is still quite um, one uh, among the most important um, uh, deviation we get inside GSK so it is still a challenge for us when we have a leak of course it might be um, not such an impact it might be local impact but it might also involve single batch or multiple batch so impacts become very huge on single use if you think about it when it starts to impact one batch or even multiple batch because in one batch you may have one rate of peace so you may end up with putting in question mark hundreds of batches inside your, system, your production so it has a very uh, important impact this the important of uh, the impact of, uh, of integrity when you get an issue regarding uh, integrity of the single use uh, may vary and is quite make be uh, very important and far more important than when you are dealing with um, stainless steel process for example um, when what I would um, uh, I'm going to give you uh, two examples uh, work with uh, um, what uh, uh, some cases and I would look first to the typical cases where you don't have sterility impact but it's more a question of technical impact maybe business impact and for this I'm uh, taking uh, some work of uh, one of my colleague Ludovic Peters um, who has been working on bioreactor um, we wanted to introduce um, a bioreactor for viral uh, vaccine uh, upstream process in different contexts, methyl cell line, we wanted to have adherent and non adherent multi-type of virus, um, and we wanted to use it in a BL3 process. Um, which is high biosafety level required and of course um, the limitation of this is to make sure uh, that we have a protection of the operator and a containment and here I'm going to present you what we have done in such a case uh, to tackle uh, those um, uh, points um, and so what but before to do it I want to say here we are in a situation when you are dealing uh, with um, the introduction of such a single use and you want to protect uh, the operator uh, you are uh, more uh, dealing about not having the product going out of uh, your uh, single use system uh, versus when you work uh, this is a green box here when you work on uh, more sterility you want to avoid that the contamination is coming inside your product and we speak more about pinhole because even if you have a very tiny hole you may have introduction of a bacteria inside your bag uh, while here we are more looking about gross leak where there is a risk for the operator and uh, for your installation um, in those cases so if we uh, look at um, this aspect of the risk assessment for the operator contamination uh, we've been working with FMEA methodology to assess all the risk and tackle them so if you go here from the bottom to the up 
you can have uh, a bag, uh, uh, bag integrity, a rupture of this bag integrity inducing a leak of liquid of gas, and um, you can have a liquid projectile or really spilling in your area. And both um, uh, aspects of those can induce operator contamination. So what have we done to tackle this? When you have liquid protection, you have external protection of your operator. When uh, you have um, also spilling inside the area, you need to have retention vessel, making sure you are um, collecting uh, what is uh, in an appropriate manner, what would spill inside your BL3 area, and you avoid, of course, that this is contaminating everything. So uh, you have retention vessel, retention area, and uh, finally, having this in um, in your uh, place in place you uh, still are making sure that the operator uh, following um, any um, uh, risk by medical follow up um, so uh, if we look in detail regarding now the design and uh, the aspect of the single use um, we uh, have different type of risks that were identified in our uh, risk analysis. Any contact with cutting object, any contact with high temperature were seen as a risk, overpressure and friction. Uh, when we look at cutting object, typically the, the, the risk we have identified is the unpacking of the system. The re so we, we have asked to have unpacking with easy tier, so system where you don't need any cutting system, you just open them. We have removed then any cutting object from the area. And we have also done a pre-use pressure test here to make sure even if it's a gross leak test, we want to make sure that the system is not having gross leak and we, we want them to avoid any, by this way, any leak inside the area. If we look at high temperature, we have avoid to have any steam nearby a single use bioreactor. We have also avoid to have no hot, hot uh, water for injection closed from this single use, and um, we have a, a void, uh, put in place system to avoid double wall over here because you have a double wall around the bioreactor and you don't want to have any overheat that could bring a, a, a point of, um, of leak. Um, for overall pressure, that's where we have, if you've seen, um, the tackle uh, the most action. Uh, we have worked on exhaust air heater um, and exhaust cooler, so to limit what is uh, coming out as, uh, uh, um, as vapor, but also to avoid that this vapor is blocking the filter. Uh, we also we have put in place some automatic switch that allow to go to a second exhaust in case of uh, uh, clogging or plugging of uh, the field. And we have really worked on straight line to make them as short as possible and as straight as possible to avoid any accumulation. We have also limit any direct pressure on the system and we have some automatic pump uh, for um, automatic stop maybe on pump and gazing. Regarding friction, we, there was no critical action identified because the system is inflated and so there was uh, um, and pre test so we didn't see any um, action there to be tackled. So with all this action in place, we have been able to say, okay, in this condition, taking all this, we can use uh, this system for biosafety level 3 compliance. Now I'm going to take another example uh, regarding in integrity, but more linked to sterility. So this is a case where typically uh, your sterility might be impacted. When we work on sterile products, um, the action, of course, that we ask at the supply, supplier level, we want to have all manufacturing step of the single use to be qualified with critical process parameter, and we want validation package. We expect this from the supplier that meet this is what is very important our uh, user requirement. You need, of course, to know the range, the operating range you're going to use, and this is more the point that was on what the second point here that I have tackled at GSK. You have to look 
at your process and you really have to um, look what is the operating pressure, the operating temperature, the time of use, uh, if you, are, you have some agitation, what is the type of agitation you want to use in your process, transport, if there is any transport of, uh, of um, uh, the product you need to tackle it, and you, of course, need to, to cover this. You need to also have a good training in place and have enough check in production. This is really what needs to be done at the end user uh, level. Um, I want to show this. If you look at um, the life cycle of a single use from the manufacturing side, transportation to the end user, then use by our uh, manufacturing bulk, eventually transport inside uh, between site or uh, inside GSK, and then uh, uh, final uh, vaccine manufacturing. What are the typical? We have looked again at um, um, the defect we have been seeing for now several years of use. Um, what we see is that at the level of the manufacturing, uh, we see um, the different type of um, uh, leak that can occur and defect we may see is defective component, weld issue, uh, because there are still a lot of manual weld, not always automated, and connection tubing to hose bar has been some, time, some, some issue in some cases. And so uh, what we see here is that um, for uh, this, all this type of defect, um, you typically may have some epin or leak, specifically on weld issue. When you deal with transport, uh, how do we tackle this, sorry? Um, we want, of course, to improve component and design. That's where the design is so important. You have to have a good choice of connection, tubing, to make sure that your integrity during qualification is covered. But we still see, and specifically on manual weld and so on, some remaining risk uh, uh, during, due to manual operation. For um, transportation from the supplier to TSK, uh, we have, um, you may have, uh, during the transportation, creation on film pinhole due to contact of components, for example, cable tie or connection, connector uh, or clamp with the film. The film being really um, in, uh, I would say, the point that which is really fragile inside a, a single use. So for this, how do we tackle it? We ask validation uh, of single-use transportation. We typically ASTM or ISTA. We leave it. We leave some freedom to the supplier, but we want to have some supportive data to show that the system from uh, the single-use manufacturing to uh, our facility that this, this risk has been tackled. Because, like we say. That's also a point where you have uh, some pin hole uh, that could be created. After, when you are at GSK, like I said, the handling of the bag, the connection, are points where you may have some um, uh, creation of hole. Typically, what we have seen inside GSK is more gross leak, so leak above 10 micron uh, that you could see visually. Typically, the hole is when you install the bag and you don't follow appropriately uh, the work instruction, or if you use cutting uh, system like we discussed for bioreactor, connection might be a wrong way of doing the connection, for example. And so, how do we tackle this? Uh, the hole in film, we eliminate any sharp edge, and we have a good uh, way of working for installation. And for connection, we improve this by training and design, which is very important. So based on this, if you can see the, the different area, what is for us need to be uh, covered by the supplier is the manufacturing and the shipping. And we really, for this, ask them to cover design, um, uh, a design space for what they are creating, validation, identification of critical parameters, having appropriate in-process control. For, for this, if you here see uh, a typical single use or a bag, we also differentiate um, 
the storage area, which is where you, what would be in the long contact uh, with uh, the product, from what is more a short-term uh, contact uh, transfer, typically, of product. Um, and we are, of course, this is more critical, and we uh, want to tackle on storage. We ask the supplier uh, to tackle um, um, uh, any pinhole on this storage part uh, by doing a sen very sensitive integrity test. From our point of view, to, to, uh, regarding now what is done within GSK, so the use uh, and uh, shipping and emptying, uh, we are going also to define the process design. We need, of course, to have our validation and in process control. Again, here, uh, the critical part would be the storage. And for this uh, reason, we will uh, need to show that all through our life cycle, uh, this, uh, uh, all this part and uh, in particular, the storage part uh, stays sterile uh, despite any shipping or any manipulation. Um, so how do we end up? So why the part that is linked to the supplier, we ask him to cover validation, like we say, for the transport. And inside, after the, the uh, validation that we uh, and the critical parameter identification, we ask the supplier to finally, um, in routine, test also uh, um, an inter uh, one hundred percent integrity test in routine. We will differentiate the storage part where we ask a very sensitive um, uh, uh, integrity test from more the short term or, or transfer part where we would request more uh, a leak test. And uh, for uh, what is inside GSK, after all the qualification of the life cycle through a bacterial challenge test, what would remain for us is in practice is a visual inspection and some media simulation all through our process. Um, what, so for us, uh, why do we have this 100% supplier uh, integrity test? Is because we think that after um, uh, the uh, qualification that has been done, there are still some remaining risk and where we need this high sensitivity integrity test uh, for the moment. Um, so if I can show, so if we look at the past, because we have been implementing this strategy for now uh, a year, we see that on all the system where we have implemented this strategy of qualification and then supplier integrity test, and then uh, knowing on our part, doing our qualification and visual inspection, we have uh, observed no leak. Uh, on the system that has followed this strategy. The remaining, we mean, the remaining leak we observe are on components that are not tested for the moment at the level of the supplier. So the conclusion for us is that we follow all the, um, in the recommendation of uh, international groups HBPOC and BPSA, with a very important point on uh, quality by design and development and validation. And for us, if you follow this and you have your chipping test and you have your quality by design, then with a quite light uh, um, um, follow-up uh, on uh, the manufacturing with the tests you keep in place, you are very confident to have a system that will be uh, completely integral throughout your process. Um, and so I would finish by highlighting really for me uh, the challenge. For me, for regarding integrity, we need to have um, uh, to share with supplier and work with supplier to have uh, the integrity in place because you have to define what you need, what is uh, critical for you. Then uh, you need uh, to have a risk assessment approach to um, define uh, the appropriate strategy because uh, this is for me, um, uh, there is no point to add tests without having a, a clear risk identified. Quality by design is key. There is no uh, integrity test that can replace a bad design. And so based on all this, a good relationship between user and supplier is key uh, to succeed.
And we have, like I said, uh, we have, I highlight here the really important point uh, to, to be tackled. With this, uh, I, I will let Stephen uh, take again the word and we will answer questions after uh, the presentation of Don. Yep, thank you, Dr. Maisie. Uh, as you just mentioned, we will have a live question and answer session at the end of the webinar, so please feel free to send in your questions at any time during the webinar via the questions tab located <coughs> directly below your webinar screen, and we'll go through these at the end of the presentation. Now, please allow me to introduce our second speaker. Donald Young is a product manager for bioprocess containers at Thermo Fisher's Bioproduction Division Facility in Logan, Utah. He has a Bachelor of Arts degree in biology and a Master of Science degree in public health. Don has 10 years of experience as a product manager and started his career as a laboratory technician specializing in cell culture and joined Thermo Fisher after working as a medical science liaison at Abbott Laboratories and Merck, Sharp and Dome for 12 years. Don's management of bioprocess containers entails participation on cross-functional teams that manage change control, pricing, supply change, film portfolio, training, product customization, and component library maintenance. I'll now be handing over to our second presenter. Welcome, Mr. Young. Well, thank you very much, and uh, thanks to the uh, the audience for taking time out of your busy schedule. Okay, so I will be talking about uh, the supplier's uh, position and their, their strategy uh, related to uh, integrity testing and assurance. And the, I'm limiting my comments to the flexible bag containers, not the rigid walled containers so much. Uh, my, all, all this will be truly the single-use bioprocess container, the bags. So what are we talking about in leak testing and prevention? And it's really that prevention side. I'll talk about leak testing first. This is my agenda slide, by the way. Uh, I'll talk about the testing first and then how we uh, how we deploy strategies, how a supplier would deploy strategies uh, to prevent those leaks. And that is the goal from our customers. It is 100% leak-free, as, as Charlotte pointed out in, in her uh, presentation. There's really two types of leaks. On the left-hand side, there's a pinhole leak, which can be on the bag itself and can be at the seam or it can be even along the tubing. Uh, on the fluid transfer uh, set uh, that's usually attached to the bag. Uh, or there's something that's called a tortuous path leak. And this is a path that occurs at a junction, at a connection point, whether it's at the chamber, the bag chamber, and the port that is welded into the bag chamber or along the tubing set at those, uh, at those junction points where rigid uh, connectors meet flexible tubing. These tortuous path leaks occur uh, usually uh, more over, over time. They, they de can develop over time. And since some of the bags are deployed, that we sell are deployed and may have a two to three year life uh, cycle while they're in use for retention samples or storage samples, uh, there is the possibility that this can, this can develop over time. Uh, it's more commonly seen that way. These bags are containing, as again, as Dr. Massey mentioned, they're containing bulk drug substances or bulk drug products, and thus they are uh, they are under the uh, requirements of 21 CFR. Uh, they're viewed as containers, bulk drug containers, and thus these container closure system tests must be conducted on them. And the reason is why is to provide that adequate protection against foreseeable external factors in storage and use that can cause deterioration or contamination of the drug product. Uh, this is what guides our customers. This is what guides suppliers. Uh, our customers' uh, re requirements are usually our requirements too. Closure system, uh, excuse me, closure system testing can uh, uh, take many forms. Uh, a bubble test, it's also called a hydrostatic test. This is where a bag would be inflated and, uh, and uh, the uh, porting clamped off and it would be submerged underwater and it, you see it bubbles formed on the outside. This is 
like the bike tire test um, that I've done so many times in my in my life. A, a pressure decay uh, vacuum decay test system is commonly uh, deployed uh, on shop floors by manufacturers and even at end users. Uh, point of use. Tracer gas permeation leak tests are a little bit more expensive. They're a little, little bit more uh, sensitive. Um, dye penetration tests are usually restricted to blister packs, that sort of uh, 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 drug container. And microbial container or closure system uh, uh, ingress challenges, immersion tests, uh, can be a primary. And also we see, we've been asked by customers to do uh, correlating tests related to other primary uh, closure system integrity tests such as pressure decay or the tracer gas permeation tests. So uh, suppliers can perform one or more uh, and often have this uh, in, in ingress testing as a, uh, as a, as a correlating data uh, source for our customers. Talk about pressure decay, I'll go through this very quickly. Uh, as you can see, these can be deployed on very, very large bags. Uh, there is an inflation cycle where the bag has to be restrained in some sort of rigid container, uh, and it's inflated with air. Uh, there's a charge time that allows the bags uh, to uh, unfold or expand a little bit, uh, the settling time, and then the test time. As you can see, this is a typical chart on uh, on a uh, pressure decay test where it's inflated here. You can see the charge time where the bag is uh, actually stretching out a little bit and getting rid of any folds, kind of uh, inflating fully uh, the settle time and on the test time. And I want to take, draw your attention to the time required for testing. These tests can be very, very long. Uh, depending on the size of the bag, the larger the bag, the longer the test, uh, and then sensitivity will suffer. So unless you want to run a longer test, you lose some sensitivity, uh, but you do have the ability to test um, very, very large bags um, in situ as used on the, the end user shop floor. Inert gas tracer tests are require more expensive equipment. You have a vacuum chamber, a helium source, you can see down here a vacuum chamber, and then a mass spectrometer uh, to, to do the measuring. I want to draw your attention to the graph and, uh, and the test time. It's much shorter. In, in helium testing, the, uh, the bags are, are inserted and connected in the vacuum chamber, and then the air is drawn out of them and replaced with helium and out in that uh, vacuum chamber, there's helium sniffer probes uh, that can detect any helium uh, ex uh, exiting the bag at a faster than normal rate. This is a much, much faster test. It can be performed on shop floors in a 100% lot test manner because it's a fast test. And many uh, suppliers now have this as an optional test service. Uh, in their uh, uh, available to their customers. For pressure decay, uh, you can see some of the ranges. I'll draw your attention to the gross leak flaw sizes, uh, 100 to 1,000 microns. This is definitely visible to the naked eye range. Uh, so uh, typically, uh, this is the sensitivity range you uh, you have. You can get uh, fine leak uh, testing uh, uh, programs, uh, uh, excuse me, software uh, and, and valid, excuse me, validated programs uh, uh, installed on the uh, on the test equipment uh, to test for fine leaks. But this is usually the test range uh, in that high 100 to 1,000 range. For inert tracer gas, you can get much, much more sensitive. You can get down below the level of, uh, of water leaking, which is about 18 microns, maybe a little less, maybe a little more. Uh, helium testing, uh, the inert gas tracer testing, can uh, detect uh, holes as small as one microns, usually in the one to three micron 
are the claims made by suppliers uh, with this test service. Uh, and at least in one instance, uh, documented public information on microbial ingression uh, is at about four microns, so this is below the level of microbial ingression. Truly, the, the uh, another tr uh, very important uh, requirement from, from our customers. You do have a bit of a, a, a sacrifice when you move to inert gas tracer testing. Uh, you can build vacuum chambers that are really large, uh, but I, I'm not sure how many suppliers have done that. I know Thermal has not. Our size limit is about 200 liters, all the way down to the very small 50 milliliter bags. Uh, typical, we feel this is the, the normal range that customers will price, place their high value uh, drug, bulk drug substances in. Um, we've seen it in higher volumes, but not uh, not uh, not most commonly, it's usually 200 liters or less. Bulk tests, uh, pressure decay, and uh, an inert gas can test uh, completed BP, BPC assemblies, as well as just standalone uh, fluid transfer sets. And that's uh, that's uh, the kind of the, the limitations and, and the, the first part of my agenda is talking about leak testing. And now I want to shift into uh, discussing uh, the areas for a supplier to consider uh, when, del when building and delivering a product, a single-use bag by a process container. The three key areas which the bag integrity must be controlled or at the manufacturing site, and I would argue it goes, as, as Dr. Massey mentioned, it starts much much sooner than that in component selection and uh, the qualification of those components and those connection systems. Uh, but let's move to the shop floor, the manufacturing shop floor. There needs to be validated processes that are routinely checked. Uh, there needs to be in-house, optional in-house testing, as, excuse me, uh, uh, mandatory as well as optional in-house leak testing. And uh, it's very important to have best practices in handling and packaging these products. They are flexible bags, and shipping can damage them uh, during transportation. That's the second part, making sure that these products are properly packaged and there is inspection occurring uh, both uh, as, it's added, as it is packed up and sent out and uh, at the manufacturer shop floor, as well as incoming inspection at the end user's uh, warehouse. And then finally, best practices for handling and placement of the bags, the bioprocess containers, and there's another chance for uh, integrity testing just prior to use. So at the manufacturing shop floor, uh, we focus on validated manufacturing processes that drive consistent error-free manufacturing. And we also uh, complement that and check those processes with, with again, these mandatory in-house testing uh, steps that are either 100% uh, or statistically validated uh, and with a validated sample size. The standard uh, testing protocols include visual inspection, that's a 100%. Integrity testing, which can occur at either, again, as the bubble test, pressure decay, or, or burst testing, or tracer gas testing. Uh, the strength test is where the burst tensile and the pull testing come in. Uh, and then proper packaging and handling, which include dust vacuum sealing the dust covers, to prevent shifting during transportation, covering sharp edges and filters with protective materials, that's the bubble wrap, uh, multiple bagging, so double uh, dust cover packaging, training, uh, routine training and inspection, in some cases duplicate or redundant inspections, uh, and, and in-house uh, testing, when we say manipulation, that's, uh, that's our qualification of these components. 
these component systems, which usually uh, consists of a piece of tubing and a connector, and an, a manipulation aid in some cases, where, where these are assisted tests. Fixtures, holders, things to pull and stretch film and, and, and hold connection points. Our tensile testing is conducted with a variable speed clamp that pulls the joint to failure. We test maximum pull, failure, location slip and stretch, and the film must fail before the film to film or film to port seals fail. Uh, that's the sign of a proper seal, proper seam. First testing, we do a, 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 a shop floor, highly pressurized air to determine the failure mode and the max pressure. Um, again, assuring that the film seal, uh, film to film or film support seal is stronger than the film itself. And then we also have uh, optional testing uh, with pressure decay and uh, inert gas mass spec testing. The testing, uh, the optional testing is conducted on the manufacturing shop floor. Uh, it's, uh, it's conducted post-assembly, so after the chamber is manufactured and all the tubing appurtenances are added, that's when the, uh, the, the integrity test, the leak testing, uh, is performed at the end of the manufacturing line prior to packaging, irradiation, and, and shipment to customer. Uh, the tests occur, uh, it, it's a 100% lot test. It's a non-destructive test, and leak results are usually included or should be included in the lot report re record as well as a certificate of analysis reflecting the testing and passing of the bags. Then we get to transportation and this is uh, one of the more rigorous uh, operations that is asked of a bioprocess container or bag. Uh, proper packaging and handling is very important, and then validating that packaging and those shipping configurations is the key to success. It's the key to delivering those products in a form that are fit for use. You're, when you're qualifying a packaging system, it is truly a system. It consists of many, many components, including a dust cover packaging, at least one, and possibly can uh, involve a, a rigid port container and a liner, a bioprocess container, foam pads perhaps, bubble wrap, and, and then a cardboard box uh, or, or again another uh, support container lid. Integrated test plans are required to accommodate the typical usage conditions, whether it's a dry and or liquid or powder filled uh, uh, normal use condition. What's the temperature range? This needs to be factored in uh, to, to make sure the test plan accommodates that. You must use established and qual uh, qualification and validation strategies. Uh, you must always consider the worst case scenario as the most important thing. Uh, uh, access to the larger size of bag or support container. This is especially important when shipping large volumes of liquid. Uh, bracketing can be done, which means you don't have to test every single size, but the largest and per perhaps of one or two intermediate sizes, including one of the smallest sizes. And then again, as Dr. Massey mentioned, compliance and te uh, to test established test standards, whether it's ISTA or ASTM. These can be simulated or done live. As far as live transport, we, uh, we choose the uh, simulated test mode where you do a fit check, you do atmospheric preconditioning and then horizontal impact, rotational edge drop, random vibration, more rotational edge drops, more rotational vibration, and then final inspections. You must document, the good supplier will document their results and make visual observations uh, post-test, looking at the bag itself, and then the packaging containers or, uh, or uh, materials themselves 
whether they're abraded, whether they're torn, uh, uh, or whether they're intact without any damage. The supplier will then build uh, validated shipping configurations with instructions with a model of the configuration and a bill of materials to go along with that. Uh, and, and of course, then training oper operator training to make sure that it all uh, comes together and is done consistently for every box every day. Okay, we've got the bag to the customer site now uh, to assist customers uh, in handling. Uh, a good supplier should have an unpackaging, and crating, or an inspection guide that goes along with it. Uh, that that will uh, discuss the careful manipulation. Uh, how to store the bags, watch out for those uh, wire racks with the sharp edges, uh, deploying the bag in the holding vessel, alignment of the ports and an inflation if needed. Here's an example of the table of contents that goes into greater detail, what the packaging should look like, what will be uh, the components uh, of the bioprocess container, how to unpack, how to unbox, inspecting, and then what if you have an issue report, uh, reporting an issue with contact information. Now, I, I'm going to see if I'm going to, I'm going to skip this slide. Okay, I'm going to come back to that slide in a moment. Earlier, I provided um, uh, a, 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 this, this cartoon or this uh, figure with uh, the uh, integrity testing, the shop floor, the manufacturer's shop floor, uh, the step in the process where we would, uh, a supplier would do integrity testing. Now I wanna draw your eye below that to all the steps that occur prior to use. This is the importance of, of, a, of a, a point of use shop, uh, excuse me, uh, integrity testing. Uh, uh, to consider that. Look at all those steps that have occurred, and these are very uh, 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 steps that can lead to damage in the bag, and oftentimes there is shipping damage. It's not the most common cause, uh, but if it's, the bag is not restrained properly, it can, it can happen. Shop floor testing from our customers is usually uh, a sampling, not 100% sampling. And that sampling uh, is controlled by internal SOP. The testing occurs immediately prior to use of so an in-situ situation. Uh, longer test times are needed for larger bags. I've mentioned this before. Um, and also there is a requirement for data historian compliance to make sure that uh, there's a proper traceability for those bags uh, as they enter the shop floor. Sorry. Going to back up out of this slide. So that's the importance of point of use integrity testing. Uh, to do one final check before filling that bag in the, at the end user shop floor. I mentioned this earlier. Here is uh, uh, some differences in the test. Uh, uh, integrity testing using uh, inert gas or helium uh, tracer gas or just a straight uh, uh, established standard uh, pressure decay test. I've talked about the whole size detection limit. I also talked about uh, 100 to 1,000 microns as the gross whole size detection range. Uh, for the fine uh, whole size detection range, it can be as, as low as 12 and uh, in the 12 to 15 micron range. We've seen some suppliers making claims to 10 as a theoretical uh, um, number. Uh, complete assembly can be tested in some cases in pressure decay, uh, but most often it's a chamber only test. It is, does not test to a whole size and detect a whole size below microbial ingression but yes to water ingression, and it is not a uh, destructive test. You can see the difference with the inert gas tracer testing. You can test full assemblies, 
Uh, you can detect one to three micron hole below the limit of ingression and obviously below the, the limit of water ingression as well. The helium test is a much faster test. It's a much more uh, sensitive test, but it's also a much more expensive test. You need a lot more expensive equipment, um, but, but there are significant advantages to that helium test. Okay, this is my last slide, I think. Uh, the considerations for end-to-end -end integrity testing, you should review a, your supplier's quality assurance testing protocol. Understand that when you do your audits, review their internal handling and BPC placement SOP. How do they train their operators on their shop floor? Review their packaging SOPs. Review their shipping SOPs. Uh, you should also review their goods in their components goods in SOP, as well as their component qualification strategy. You should consider point of manufacture integrity testing for those bags that are going to be used in those high value applications. And consider uh, a point of use integrity testing, as well as a, as a final check before those bags are deployed. This is my regulatory disclaimer. Thank you very much, all, um, and it's time for questions. Thank you, and yes, as Mr. Young just said, we will begin the question and answer session of the webinar. But once again, I would like to remind the audience that you can still send your questions in via the questions tab located directly below your webinar screen. So now our first question is, what is the typical failure rate you've seen in single-use bags? Uh, I believe this was for you, Charlotte. Yeah, and I'm really happy for this question. Um, so you have to see it in, um, it's not one simple answer. So when you start using single use, like I did try to explain through my slide, you, before you implement any uh, learning, training, qualification, uh, if you don't do it, there is a high risk. The main root cause, if I see, for example, uh, some uh, a new building that would introduce single use without training uh, uh, and testing system with operator, you're going to have a high quantity of defects. I would say I've heard sometimes up to 10% even outside uh, my company um, uh, leakage due to either um, things that were occurring in, um, uh, as a supplier, if it has not been validated there, or uh, at, um, during the use. When you now uh, have your uh, qualification in place with all what I did uh, speak about, so as a hand user, training, qualification, uh, defining your critical parameter, defining, making sure um, they are uh, adequate to uh, what uh, the supplier is doing qualification at the supplier, qualification of transport is a key point. Then, um, so if you have all the qualification in place, then we, uh, at, uh, I see it in, typically in um, building or inside here, then the level of defect coming from uh, your uh, handling is very low. Um, and it's almost to, to zero because people know how to handle them, they do it appropriately, the design is good, so nothing happened. It still remains, and that's why we say um, the transport, we have this validation again. When you have validation of transport, i never seen a damage in transport when I had a transport following the validation I had in hand. However, I still see sometimes some damage, and typically what I say, pinhole, um, we can, could steal them, and, but we remain at low level, but you want to tackle any defect because don't forget of the impact. When you have one defect, uh, one leak in production, you not only lose the product, you also have to investigate the complete lot regarding the single use. So you may have hundreds of batching question mark. And so for this reason, so I say at the beginning, you have to handle validation and all the aspects I show are the main factor and depending on what you have in hand, this is what is going to cause leak. After you put in place the qualification, for us, a remaining risk is um, a typically manual step at supplier. Thank you. Our next question 
is what kind of shipping study is recommended when shipping the final sterile product in single-use bags? Uh, okay. Actually, for you as well, Charlotte. Yeah. Again, uh, again, we're gonna use uh, the same type of standard Don has been presenting in very much detail, like ASTM and ISTA. Uh, but you're gonna do it, of course, with filled bag, and you're gonna have uh, to um, to follow the appropriate level. For example, if you're shipping on pallet you're going to have to use the ISTA tree. This is one example. So you have to look inside all this uh, standard, the one that would be appropriate for your shipping, depending on if you do truck shipping, if you do airplane shipping, and so on. But uh, it is very important if you follow the ISTA and the STM, uh, you go in detail and you will find, and there are a proper lab that can do uh, the test on field back for you. And what we do just also as a reminder is when we do a bacterial challenge, we cover this step. So this means the bag filled with TSB will be having will be uh, having all this challenge done, this transportation challenge. And after that, we will look if the bacterial challenge by immersion, for example, for transportation is still good. Thank you. Our next question is, are there any problems with leak testing bags with aseptic connectors? Uh, Mr. Young, would you like to take this? Yes. Uh, yes. I uh, hope you can hear me. Yes, there, there is. Uh, we, we've been frequently asked this question, and the, the challenge is, is that paper membrane, uh, which is a, a leak path, it will not be a, uh, a a barrier to the helium, so the helium or any inert tracer gas will escape. And if you try to apply pressure to it, I think you might have some problems in doing a pressure decay test. So we can test up to those connection points. We'd have to clamp off immediately um, proximal uh, to the aseptic connector, but we cannot test through it. We rely on the suppliers' uh, qualification, their testing data, their lot release data for that information. And if I may add on this, indeed, in our strategy, we will ask for uh, a part like uh, an aseptic connector. We will also ask 100% testing of the connector at the supplier. Thank you both. Uh, the next question, is there really any global helium shortage? Don, I think this is for you again. Yeah, there is, and uh, we're being pressured um, uh, to, and we're seeing a price increase uh, on, on our cost on that. So yes, uh, helium is is prioritized uh, for the medical, uh, the hospital industry, the medical, well, not really medical device, it's really the hospital industry for all those um, uh, uh, positive PET uh, and uh, CAT scanners. That require the the super cool uh, the super cooling of the helium, and there's also some um, big mines that have closed down in the U.S. Uh, most notably in Texas, uh, helium is a byproduct of natural gas mining, and when this uh, big mine in Texas finally closed down a year or two ago, uh, it had to, it's having ripple effects because new mines aren't coming on fast enough. So yeah, we are seeing a, a shortage in helium and, uh, and and a cost increase on this. Well, thank you both, and thank you, audience members, for your questions. Unfortunately, that's all the questions we do have time for. Uh, before we finish the webinar, though, I would like to ask our presenters, Dr. Macy and Mr. Young, if they have any closing remarks. Um, so, Charlotte, do you have any closing remarks? Uh, no, what I can say eventually, if you provide me uh, the question by email, I'm, uh, I can make sure I answer also to the people because I see some questions not answered, and I would like uh, to make sure people get it. And thank you for all the questions we have received. I think it was really interesting. And uh, Don, do you have any closing remarks? No, nothing from me. Thank you. Well, thank you both. And now I would like to take this opportunity to once again thank our presenters. It was Charlotte Mazey, Product Manager in Global Support, GSK Vaccines, and Donald Young, Senior Product Manager at Thermo Fisher Scientific, for sharing their knowledge with us. I would like to remind our audience that you can view this and other webinars on demand by visiting biopharma-asia.com forward slash on demand hyphen webinars. 
And if you are watching this on demand, then please feel free to send your questions over to me at S-T-E-P-H-E-N dot Edwards at biopharma-asia.com and we'll get those answers to you. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day.